right here in Virgil. I'm actually sitting just a couple blocks away from where that Meridian photo is taken right now as I do this presentation. And then if we were to teleport a four and a half hour drive away north of here, or 885 kilometers, that's me standing uh, like this scary yellow machine um, next to the northern cairn of the Bruce Trail. So my lovely mother and one of her friends, they drove me up north on this incredible spring thaw kind of uh, time of the year where there was still winter in its grips up on the Bruce Peninsula. And I was going to start there in what we would call a nice spring in southern Ontario up there. Still very much so winter. So when I entered Bruce Peninsula National Park, this was the scenery. Um, it was a really intense, almost rude, you could say, introduction to the 37 days that lay ahead. Because the first four days were a lot like this morning, as many of you may have looked at the window and saw. It was just above zero, around two to four degrees Celsius. It was raining sideways, it felt like. It almost felt like it was raining from the ground up. Um, and this big, fat, low-pressure system came up from the Midwestern states, and it just sat, making a big spring, wintry mess all over southern Ontario. And it really sat on the Bruce Peninsula. So there was choppy, chaotic, violent waves, huge chunks of ice, windswept surfaces. The Niagara Escarpment up here on the Bruce Peninsula is exposed, um, so it has very rugged shoreline. And that's limestone, a lot of that rock. And the way limestone erodes with water and all the action from water hitting it is it creates cracks and holes and caves. The one on the bottom right here is the famous Grotto Rock Formation, kind of in the heart of Bruce Peninsula National Park. Now, once you get away from that grotto, though, um, the trails get really rugged. On the left here, for example, that snowpack there, it's hard to tell in the photo, but it could be anywhere from one to four feet deep. And that big black slice or crack in between the snow is just that. It's a slice in the earth. Um, those cracks on top of the Niagara Escarpment could be anywhere from one to 100 feet deep. It depends on how you're stepping over them or around them. And with the snow and the slippery ice, that was extremely tricky. And with all this rain and snow melt going on at the same time, I had a very logistical challenge, as you can imagine, um, drying out my gear and, of course, keeping myself dry. At this point, it wasn't just a matter of I don't want to be miserable and cold and wet. Nobody likes that in the living in Canada here. But in trying to avoid that, I couldn't. Uh, it was four straight days of cold, wet, melting snow and rain, and therefore flooding as well. So that's all my clothes in the top right, hanging out and drying out. It was probably the most useless dry out session ever. It really just turned out to be some strange kind of aesthetic at my I camp. do not want them to see me. So as we continue on the Bruce Peninsula, we start to see some really dramatic scenery. Of all the 37 days that I did on the Bruce Trail, um, the northern part at Bruce Peninsula is the most remote. It's the most wild in terms of actual geographical space and natural area, uninterrupted natural area. Um, it's black bear country. It's eastern Massasauga rattlesnake country as well. Um, and you don't have reception at some parts in the deeper parts of the peninsula or national park. So again, this was my intro to 37 days. And even though on the top right there, excuse me, I, I'm celebrating these beautiful views and this brief moment of sunshine, that's exactly what I'm celebrating, sunshine, the simple things in life. When you live in cold rain and clouds for four days, the sunshine is beautiful. What ended up happening though is I continued on. I've been cold now for about four days, but I'm kind of trudging on and I can't fake the smile still, even though I'm shivering in that photo, um, I found my first reptile. Those who know me know I'm a reptile and amphibian fanatic. I love them. They're my favorite grouping of organisms on the planet. So that right there on the bottom left is a northern water snake, first of the year, slithering over patches of ice. Just above that, you see a red squirrel. Um, red squirrels in Ontario, preferably like old growth forests and more remote woods. You don't see red squirrels, for example, too much in big cities or downtown urban areas or agricultural areas. So again, a sign that you're in nice deep woods. Those squirrels would yell at me and chatter me and follow me along the treetops as I hiked, just to kind of shoo me along and say, hey human, get out of here, get off Bruce Peninsula and keep walking, please. And then of course, um, there was a lot of kind of wild features on the Bruce Peninsula that would be unique to the hike as I found out. Um, examples, bear country. So you see signs that say, caution, bear in area. Um, and for someone perhaps who wouldn't be as comfortable as I would hiking in bear country, that could be kind of intimidating. I didn't see any black bears, but I did see signs of tree markings and flipped over rocks. 
Now, speaking of rocks in this photo here, um, even the rocky areas seem to be flooded. And that gave me a lot of wet gear and socks, as you could imagine. And keeping care of your feet is probably akin to putting gas and oil in your vehicle. Um, it has to be done when you're hiking or else if your feet go, everything goes with it. So here's a funny little story of me drying out this desperately gross wet sock over the very stove that I cook little meals over called the BioLite camp stove. That stove's really cool actually. It, um, you might see it in the photo, there's a wire coming out of it. It's got a thermoelectric converter. So while I'm burning little twigs and debris, for example, food or drying my sock, I can also charge my phone or my flashlights or camera. Then the sock fell into the fire, the inevitable, and it was probably one of the worst smells ever. That was a nice intro to the first few days of my Bruce Trail hiking experience. But I was in for the biggest shock yet um, when hypothermia came. And these are some photos from the day before I got what I would call um, a pretty moderate scale case of hypothermia. Now, there's being cold and wet. And as I said, being Canadians, we've all been cold and wet at the same time. We know it's not good for our body, but we usually can get to our vehicle home or put more clothes on. Where I was, if you look at the photo on the top right, that was not an option. It was uh, hiding between the wet or the wetter of places and it stayed really cold. And in the bottom right there, beside, those, beside the photo of me walking through inevitable icy floodwaters, that's me kind of not tapping in, I'd like to call it, but um, making a smart move. I covered up in a cave. I realized I was getting this very weird, very dreary type of cold that even I've like never felt before in my life. Um, I got kind of dizzy, almost like hallucinogenic. It felt like the world was kind of wavy and I started getting lethargic. I was doing push-ups, trying to ram protein and beef jerky and everything else into me. I just could not get warm. So right after that photo was taken, resting in the cave, contemplating things, even getting dripped on inside the cave, I called my emergency contact, um, which I'd set up in advance. Thankfully, I only had to use my emergency contacts once. Um, here's the photo. And on top left there, we have the lovely, lovely David and Penny Hoskin, who live near Lion's Head. Lion's Head's a little community, <clears throat> excuse me, up on the Bruce Peninsula. So I phoned, Dave answers the phone, and with crackly reception, I said, I am going to look at my map and use my, basically my uh, compass. I'm bushwhacking to the ne nearest dirt road. He picked me up in his truck, and I remember just two days of showering, shivering in the shower, napping, waking up, shivering some more. And uh, two days later, though, I had rehydrated. I had shaken it off to an extent. Another lovely couple in the photo below also warmed me up with nice local soups in their bio or eco-friendly carbon neutral home. A lot of interesting homes and lifestyles up on the peninsula. And those two couples, if you will, got me back on my feet. And when I was back on my feet, it was like a whole new chapter of this trip really kicked off. I was super fired up and inspired. Now, I don't know about some of you listening right now, but I think there's something to be said about being Canadian when spring comes around. It's my favorite season because I truly believe for lots of us, something biologically and chemically um, changes inside of you when those first double digit days come around, when you hear the frogs call for the first time, when you hear the robin sing for the first time, even in late February, when we see life and growth popping out of the forest floor, um, I think it makes us happy and more energized as Canadians, generally speaking, and that's just biology. So here I am recovering from hypothermia. During these photos with all this beauty sort of being thrown at me, I haven't fully recovered yet though. I still had shivering moments. Uh, my digestive tract was a mess. I will leave it at that. And I just kept hiking. Uh, the excitement of this adventure, look at the scenery. I mean, how could I not be pulled through further, you know, every step, kilometer, um, day, whatever it was. So look at these beautiful views here. This is, I believe, um, if I remember correctly, in Calpoyas Bay, also up near Bruce Peninsula. Look at that water on Georgian Bay there. It is really that blue. That is not with photo editing. Um, you got to see it for yourself if you haven't been up there. And then on the left, you start to see some signs of spring again. The top left there looks like a picture of an ordinary twig. Um, but when I picked it up, it moved and squirmed. But it turns out it's part of a caterpillar family, um, part of the geometrid moth family. So their larvae, if you will, look like little stick insects or twigs or even bird poop. And they move when you pick them up. So even though I was getting grand vistas and views like this one, I was always being from a biology background, uh, looking for the little beautiful bits of life out there as well. Although this trip has been challenging and grueling up until this point, um, the excitement and the wonder of Ontario's biodiversity 
kept me going. Um, so now we're heading further down the peninsula, getting closer towards Wyerton. Um, this is a strange collection of photos, but I remember this all happened in one day, so bear with me. Right before I got into Wyerton, I hit a stretch of the peninsula, if you remember the photos prior, where I was up on cliff tops a lot. Even though there's a ton of water down below, being Ontario, look at all this fresh water, the water doesn't really collect on the cliff tops where the Bruce Trail is. So for about two days straight, even though it was a wet spring, I couldn't find any pooled or water sources, creeks, swamps, you name it. I couldn't find water that I could access in any great quantity and filter. So I was literally sucking water off of the leaves of um, cedar trees bit by bit as I hiked by them. Um, and then when I got into Wyerton, kind of two things happened at once. I came down this beautiful staircase, found water pumping out of the side of the rocky escarpment, and I just trusted it. I looked above, I knew what kind of landscape was above and upstream of that, and I basically uh, just put a plastic bottle I'd found under it and drank it. Best water I'd ever tasted. And then up on the top right there, that's me celebrating. So yes, you could say I'm riding the bull. Why am I celebrating? Because I'm rehydrated. That felt really, really good. And that was also five minutes after I got hit with a hailstorm in the middle of a farmer's field. Um, and the hail pieces were almost marble size and I was eating them when they were done. Bottom right here, same farmer's field, that is snake skin. And you can see the little snake's head and eye if you look carefully too. And that means a bird of prey has eaten a snake on top of a farmer's post. So pretty cool stuff you discover along the way. Now, speaking of farmers, you do pass through a fair few agricultural areas on the Bruce Trail. Oh, next photos are loading. In between all these patches of wildness. So sometimes like the bottom left here, you find yourself, you find yourself hiking on these really remote um, rural roads. And in the spring, they're muddy. They're part of the ecosystem. You can see how this swamp here has flooded over onto the trail. So again, dry feet, not really an option. Um, but look at some of these views. The beauty of the Niagara Escarpment and why it gives so much opportunity for biodiversity or species richness is because of its physical complexity. So if you look on the right there in that beautiful kind of mossy uh, cavern or slice in the earth that you can hike through, um, all that down there is biodiversity, really concentrated. There are mosses, lichens, frogs, snakes, mammal burrows, you name it. And again, as I said earlier, math, not my strong point, but my only math lesson today is the more surface area you have, so the more cracks and spaces in between all the other spaces, that means there's going to be more opportunities for species to make themselves at home, hunt, hibernate, mate, look for new resources, etc. And then you see a familiar face in the woods sometimes, even if you've been out there alone for the vast majority of it. By this point, I've worked my way down towards almost Owen Sound, and I remember seeing this lovely raccoon peeking out from the maple tree abyss. And also what's really cool is I'm working my way further south. Keep an eye as the photos progress too, because they're generally in sequential order, and you'll notice that the trees are still pretty bare, but you're going to notice that it's going to look like a summer jungle by the time this 37-day journey is over. So I'm working with the gradient of springtime, but it's happening even faster in my eyes because I'm hiking from northern to southern Ontario. So it's really fascinating. It was muddy. It was rainy. Um, here's some photos of me cooking my meals at night by myself. Just, those are really peaceful, beautiful times, listening to owls and coyotes and uh, frogs and the like call. They were peaceful times. I can say that I was certainly alone, but I never felt lonely during any of this because you're always surrounded by so much light. Trying to click through the next photo here. There we go. And speaking of life, um, I said earlier, I'm a reptile enthusiast. Uh, there are over 30 species of reptile and amphibian here in Ontario. Um, and if we get further into southern Ontario, we'd be surprised about that biodiversity. This is the really common eastern garter snake. Um, I remember particularly that after I took her photo, I know it was a her because she had uh, a very clearly pregnant belly. And given the time of year, um, she was a pregnant female just basking in the sun's rays. Snakes are cold-blooded. That means that, sorry, that doesn't mean their blood is actually cold. It just means they're a living thing that can't regulate their own temperature. So when it gets, when you get those warmer patches of sun on those spring days, they are out to enjoy it immediately for breeding season to fire their bodies up. Now, speaking of spring days, you're starting to see a little more green in these photos. What I found remarkable about these swamps and wetlands here is that these particular two wetland shots were created by a beaver dam. So beavers are ecosystem engineers, and that means that they have a 
kind of disproportionate role in how they can engineer the look of an ecosystem with just something as simple as building a dam or a lodge. And they created a whole bunch of new habitat here. Now swamps and wetlands are very important for Ontarians because they provide a ton of ecosystem services. Um, they include everything from flood control to flood prevention. They're big sponges for all the water and precipitation, right? They also act as filters for pollutants and chemicals and sediment that might enter our waterways in greater amounts. And of course, they are strongholds for biodiversity and they're carbon sinks in the day and age of climate change. There's a lot of carbon locked up in these old swamps, their trees, their muddy soils, after all those years of decomposition out there. So I'm enjoying the scene, I'm watching the environment change. I'm also watching myself change. My body started taking uh, some long-term beating effects. So I gotta give my dad credit. Um, I know he wouldn't be listening right now because he's probably trying to figure out how to get onto Zoom, but I love the guy. And he had this photo when he visited me in Owen Sound, a photo idea where he talked about chasing your dreams and we were having some life chats in the woods. And he's like, hey, why don't you put a bottle of moose head on the end of your fishing rod and pretend you're always chasing it up the escarpment. So that's where that photo came from right there. Um, but amidst the humor, there were some struggles too. Um, look at the sunburn on my forearms on the bottom left. It, uh, it basically just peeled off an entire patch and went bare. Other parts of my skin were dry and pasty. Um, the photo in the middle there, uh, those shorts and those socks saw tons of trail. The shoes in that photo, I remember that day, were just soaked and muddy to the core. I know the mud was in between my toes. And those slugs in the bottom right there, they would be in between my toes too, I bet, if I didn't put those shoes on my feet. I would sometimes wake up in my tent to find, um, without exaggeration, maybe 100 to 200 slugs on the outside of my red tent, um, just enjoying that moisture and probably wondering what was going on inside. Maybe not for everybody. And speaking of not for everybody, how's this? You're hiking in the springtime. You don't really expect a storm of this nature. I'm just in between Owen Sound and Collingwood and I step out of the tree line after hearing a few rumbles of thunder and I see this and I'm going, wow, that is quite the storm. And I love storms. Anyone who knows me knows that as well. If I didn't go the biology and biodiversity route, I would have been a storm chaser. This storm chased me. Um, it dumped hail on me as well. It was really violent. It turned the uh, creeks, sorry, the ditches into creeks and creeks into temporary rivers. And instead of being a storm chaser, I got chased. I later found out a few days after that when I checked in with a brief moment of uh, internet that the very same storm produced um, a tornado warning just east of Owen Sound. So it was a good one. And then the storm passes and the beauty arrives. Um, isn't that how life goes sometime? Now the top photo there is a really stunning kind of image of all these trees. Now that is not a natural forest. Of course it is out in nature, but all those trees are the same species and they've been planted as such, giving it this kind of cool visual effect where they're all the same species, same size, same age. Now, but just because that's not a biodiverse or species rich forest, doesn't mean nonetheless that it's important habitat coverage. And what I saw a lot of um, along the Bruce Trail was these partnerships between private property owners, conservation authorities, et cetera, where replanting uh, forested and wetland areas was basically just there to expand the Niagara Escarpment corridor habitat. Very important, better than nothing. Um, on a contrast, look below, and that's what a more natural forest looks like, a little more complicated, and um, in this case, a lot more beautiful too. That was a beautiful morning, I remember hiking in. The scenery kind of just unfolds at this point, and now what I thought about the Bruce Trail that was remarkable is it, it kind of showcased the diversity in Southern Ontario of our ecosystems and habitat not just over the 37 days from north to south, but even per day, I always said it, could, it feels like you could walk through 10 different areas of the world. Um, like in these photos here, am I in British Columbia? Am I in Colorado? The photo on the bottom left could be anywhere in the world. The one on the bottom right looks like that classic windows background. It could be a farm somewhere in the Netherlands. We don't know. Um, and that's the awesome human experience of hiking, is it kind of gets your mind wandering and nostalgic about not only your own backyard, but perhaps places you haven't even been. The falls on the top left, by the way, is called Inglis Falls in Owen Sound. And as I'm hiking through this area, spring is really starting to pop. Again, I'm working my way south, further south into Ontario, where it's naturally a bit warmer, but also spring is really kind of ramping up now. And I find this species on the left here, it's called the Eastern Newt. Now the Eastern Newt has a really quite striking juvenile phase, um, which is called the Red Eft. 
And that's what we see here on the left. This beautiful amphibian was marching over the forest floor as it does because the red eft, this younger phase, it's terrestrial. It walks around on the ground after crawling out of one of the many swampy pools in the area. It then eventually morphs into its final adult phase where it's a bit more of a greeny, dark brown kind of color, has more of a sort of wavy tail for moving in the ponds, and it returns to the various streams and water in the area. So pretty cool to see that marching around. What was ironic was, as I found that, not far from that area of the escarpment, there was a huge military training ground area. So there are the sounds of explosions and like what sounded like bombs going off while I'm watching these beautiful placid, uh, you know, wonders of nature march across the forest floor amidst the trilliums. Pretty interesting contrast. Top right there, um, we have one of our species of tree frog in Ontario. We have three species here in Southern Ontario. That one is called the gray tree frog. In this photo, it's quite gray, but those colors could also be a greenish kind of tinge too, more brown. It can change color um, based on temperature, camouflage, and also the genetics of the area too. So amphibians are really starting to come out to play now at this point in the hike as we move further into spring. Next slide here. And it gets more springy and the rain just does not stop. So the view in the top left there, as I would sip my coffee like I'm about to now, was kind of my sit up and sip your coffee part of the morning. I would just look past my feet, unzip the front of the tent, and I'd see this fog, the spring budding of the trees, listening to the frogs again, picking the slugs off my tent. And the hike just kind of continued on and took a life of its own. With things starting to warm up, I saw more wildlife. And I also got a little bit closer, inch by inch, to the more civilized areas of southern Ontario. So I found my first full shelter camp out, which is really exciting. I'd set up a tent at this point for probably uh, two and a half weeks of the trip. Uh, got in a good rhythm with that, of course. There's me living tent life on the bottom right. Tent life does include spiders sometimes, like on the top right with the innocent crab spider. But then one night I got to sleep in this hut, which is a nice change of pace. And I actually got to have a legal open pit fire. So that was really uh, enjoyable. Again, once you're out here for long enough, you really start to appreciate the little things, including this slug, which is somehow eating a tiger beetle. That's a pretty intense moment happening at kind of the micro, excuse me, cosm of life. Insects play a super important role in all of our ecosystems around the world. That's why there's so many of them and they're so biodiverse. They all have these little roles unforeseen at the baseline that we might just step over. In this case, it looks like or appears to be a slug is kind of cleaning up or digesting this tiger beetle. But then again, the wonder is, how does a slug catch a tiger beetle, which is one of the fastest insects we have around? Again, wonders of nature. And now that I'm getting closer again, to central Ontario, more or less the halfway point of my trip. It just gets muddier and muddier. There's a typical look at what your boots and legs look like, not just at the end of the day, but the first hour of your day sometimes. Um, I kept myself entertained out there. Uh, I'm pretty good at doing that, especially when it comes to being outside. There's just so much going on. Um, and every photo I took, including the goofy one on the top right, was with the intention of, again, showing people one day after that hike was done, even not knowing if I'd finish it, um, that it was here to inspire people. And the guy on the bottom right there, if I remember correctly, his name is Michael, and he passed me heading northbound on the Bruce Trail at his halfway point day, and I was heading southbound on my halfway point day, and we had this cool kind of chat in the middle of the woods moment. Um, to this day, I'm not sure if he completed the Bruce Trail through hike. I have a really good feeling he did, but I thought that was kind of a remarkable bit of uh, trail magic out there. Now, speaking of trail magic, after looking at things like American giant millipedes on the top left, more garter snakes like you see there, or perhaps even that little porcupine on the bottom left there that surprised me, kind of camouflage in the rocks. You go through all these adventures in a day, and then what I call the, and I jokingly say the same thing with the cats at home, you know that hour before sunlight when the cats go crazy and they run around your house and just kind of a weird and fun vibe? Well, there was like that martini hour every day out there on the Bruce Trail. Um, and the photo on the right, I'll never forget taking it because um, the sunset was just so perfect. That to me meant when the sun was going down that my day was winding down. I was going to be able to take my shoes off, eat, relax, set up camp. Um, it was just this beautiful aesthetic every time almost, especially in the spring. And the forest just kind of glowed. And um, 
I just remember like this particular photo here, the scenery was so beautiful that it literally just sucked tears out of my eyes. I literally just saw scenery for the first time in my life that was so beautiful. I didn't even know why I was crying. Um, and that's really kind of how empowering the outdoors can be, especially when you're immersed in it for that long. And as spring ticks along, the wetlands continue to fill up with snow melt and spring rains. Um, this beautiful maple tree on the top left here is blossoming to the point now actually where you can tell the leaves are starting to burst through. There are big green ferns which love the sheltered areas of the Niagara Escarpment. Tons of streams crashing down into bigger valleys. Some of these streams might not even be flowing come summertime, so it's really nice to see them flowing in the spring. In fact, a lot of our Niagara Escarpment streams, um, they really are important for fish that swim up from Lake Ontario and other great bodies of water and that's where they can get up to the base of the escarpment to those forested and wetland areas and safely lay their eggs. Now you might be thinking, hey, that's nifty, Owen. How did you find a cold beverage out on the Bruce Trail over 885 kilometers? Well, I didn't. And I have to thank one of my sponsors named Lorna from Verge Insurance from, uh, well, this was in 2014. And uh, she came up and met me um, somewhere in Southern Ontario, not far north of Hamilton. She said, would you like a beer? And I said, well, can't say no, it's been a long time. Um, she brought me about eight tall cans of a particularly, particularly meaty beer. It's uh, quite a strong one. I was gonna be happy with just one as a treat. Um, I enjoyed, I think three to be honest or so with her. And I put on my backpack, we said, see you later. I hiked deeper into the forest at that sunset hour, found my camping spot and all I remember is, whoa, it's been a while since I've experienced an adult beverage and I was floating through that forest at sunset hour. <laughs> And I remember setting up my tent that night, and that was the only night, the only night I set up my tent in poison ivy and with boulders under my back. So that was a fun little tidbit. And of course, that's just what happens when uh, your friends show up big to support you. Now, with that sense of familiarity, you know, having that meeting with one of the sponsors, and again, my mom and her friends too came out and hiked for half a day with me. And getting back into southern Ontario, I'm far from bear and rattlesnake and no cell phone reception country. But regardless, the Niagara Escarpment is stunning. Um, for example, the city of Hamilton is the city of waterfalls. In fact, per capita in Canada, um, it earns that title because there are more named waterfalls per person or community than anywhere else in Canada. So yeah, Hamilton is a super urban center, but the Escarpment creates that habitat corridor protected space through it where the waterfalls reside. And of course, again, you start to see more signs of people wherever you go. I love the image on the bottom right there. Uh, not a big graffiti fan myself, depending where it is, but the good old Canada equals love. Uh, just made me feel really happy to be Canadian, hiking through this stunning Southern Ontario, um, seeing how our communities work with agriculture and forests and industry and community. And then of course, selfishly enjoying getting a little deeper back into those woods and um, having that time to myself again. Southern Ontario is just magic. You can see a raccoon sleeping in a tree, um, a sort of mining operation, a beautiful forest, and a step back in time where uh, these two old fellows on the tractor here are literally just stepping on the back of the tractor and riding up over a dirt road as if it probably happened uh, 50 or 100 years ago. So as we're winding down, getting closer to Niagara, my home base, Niagara on the Lake, I took this picture at the last spot that I slept on the whole Bruce Trail. This is in Short Hills Provincial Park. It's by a nice little stream. Um, and that was very, very surreal for me because Short Hills was one of my big backyards I grew up exploring, um, introduced by my family once upon a time when I was a kid. And then the moment I got a license in high school to drive, um, I found myself in Short Hills, probably more than anywhere else in Niagara, I'd say, um, to this day as well. So I spent all this time in it recreationally and then to hike back to it and sleep in it was just kind of this bizarre um, contrast of information in my head. I remember falling asleep by the creek that night um, 610 CKTV, our local radio station, uh, got in touch with me bright and early in the morning. I tried to have a conversation with them while hiking up a hill, um, one of my last big uphill hikes of the whole, the whole operation, and running out of breath and explaining how I was literally hiking home to Queenston Heights. And now I'm on the home stretch. It's the final day. I'm hiking through the Niagara Escarpments Bruce Trail in Niagara on the Lake. Um, so everything is familiar, every tree, every bend in the trail. Um, the species I'm seeing and everything. I got chased by some Canadian geese with their family and um, I thought that was just like a nice fitting Canadian end to all of this too. And 
you know, as I got back, um, I, I apologizing to yourselves and myself, not including this photo, but I had a bigger group photo of all these people waiting um, at the finish line at Queenston Heights. So right at Queenston Heights was uh, where the Bruce Trail ends or starts, depending how you look at it. And I had family, friends, community members, uh, local press there. Uh, it was really remarkable. I got to push my brother, my brother Garrett, who's in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy. I got to actually push him to the finish line on the final 100 meters, which is uh, something super special I'll never forget. Um, I'm sure he could have done that hike with me too, if he could have. And then you got these folks here, my family, my friends, um, people I met along the way on the trail who just inspired me. Um, yes, you do see duct tape on feet to combat blisters with my friend Jordan there, just an idea of what trail conditions were like. Um, I, again, you can see me probably smiling virtually even right now. It just makes my cheeks high five my eyeballs when I see all these people and how much them and my sponsors uh, supported me in all of this. And the next thing you knew it, I was back in Niagara on the lake um, 37 days later, more or less, and the Bruce Trail had been through hiked. And then the rest of my life kind of took off in this outdoors sort of fast lane. And to this day, I'm happy to still be working outside, making nature videos, educating the public, youth, students, and our school board um, about our natural wonders here in Niagara. And long and the short of it, Niagara is what inspired me to, again, do this hike in the big scheme of things. And because of Niagara full circle, now I'm here and I'm complete this presentation. So this is the part where I say thank you to the Welland Public Library and all the viewers who tuned in today. Um, if you're interested in anything else that I do regarding work, environmental projects, um, I also have some nature documentaries from Australia, Florida, um, one on Niagara here as well. There's even a video about this Bruce Trail hike. All of this is free, it's online. Um, that's what it's there for, to be viewed and to hopefully inspire. You can also check out my website, my hiking tours as well. At this point, um, I hope I've been online for all this and have been talking to my own screen. I'm going to uh, open up the floor for any questions if there is any time. So thank you. So any questions for Owen? That was a great talk. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Annie. I, I really enjoyed reminiscing and uh, hopefully it resonated with some people in this group today. Yeah, I'm open for any questions, of course, right now um, or after by email, but we can right now if anyone has any questions. Sure. You have to unmute yourself, I think, if you want to ask a question. I, I, thank you. I, I just want to know, what did you eat to keep your energy up along the way? Hey, that's a great question, Kathy. Um, I forgot to mention that. It's a pretty important one, isn't, isn't it? So I would have a very typical set meal. There wasn't much uh, variety. Breakfast was usually porridge, like oatmeal, um, with dried fruit. Lunch was usually beef jerky, um, a big protein bar, and nuts. And dinner was usually ramen noodles, Pop-Tarts, um, and another protein bar if I was being nice to myself. <laughs> Oh dear. Yeah, so you do get, um, you do get used to it. Uh, I'm a big eater, always have been, still am, and I love my food, so it was tricky to adapt to eating such a monotonous meal tone, but um, what I also found psychologically is you get really excited for that protein bar at lunchtime. You get really excited if you find a second pack of noodles at the bottom of your bag, and again, it just kind of makes the little things appreciative. Any other questions? I'd be happy to uh, answer. Do you still do the hiking as well to this point? I still do hiking in, the, in all the ways. I hike seven days a week more or less because Monday to Friday I work for the school board here in Niagara as an outdoor educator and every day we have students which is every day now that they're back in school that is. Um, we hike with those kids and take them into Short Hills and uh, Wood End. Um, I also uh, run my own private hiking tour company. I've been doing that for four years. So when I get tours, um, I'm out there in the woods with folks showing them around. And uh, if I have a day off, I'm out by myself with my family, friends, or my lover, and I'm hiking and outdoors doing something. So I'm still wow. hiking. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a few, there might be something in the chat here for questions too. Yeah, there's a couple of chat ones there. Uh, uh, 
There's one from Lisa here. It says, I was wondering what made you decide to go alone. Um, honestly, Lisa, just the sheer adventure of it. Funny enough, I did actually have about two or three candidates, good friends of mine still are, who I imagine kind of bringing along for that camaraderie, also the safety aspect of it as well. Um, but things just didn't line up for logistics, scheduling, and everything happens the way it's supposed to sometimes. And um, I also really wanted the independent test for myself. I kind of wanted to see what I was made of during all this. I was really confident with nature and the outdoors, my abilities, but just because I was really confident before the hike didn't mean I didn't want to test myself further. And uh, I got a very unique experience. I got to remain uninterrupted in nature for 37 days straight right here in Ontario. And I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest. There's another question too. Um, did you ever feel unsafe, not due to environment or weather conditions, but otherwise? Very valid question. Um, there, was, there were two incidents where I had to deal with some pretty angry farm dogs who uh, didn't like me walking on their gravel road up their big driveway. Uh, there was a German shepherd who came barreling down the driveway. We had a standoff with my hiking poles. Nobody was hurt and all that. Um, and then in Hamilton, there was a little chihuahua dog that actually tried to bite my ankles while I was viewing a waterfall. Um, so it got, it got a boot. I love dogs. It wasn't enough to hurt it, but it was enough to be like, hey, I've come this far. I don't need a dog biting my ankle right now. So um, those are the only moments where I was kind of like, whew, a little unsafe, but uh, not so much the chihuahua, but the German shepherd got my hair raising, that's for sure. And uh, hypothermia, because uh, again, you don't know if you've never had it before, which I hadn't you don't know what the progression is going to be like. You can read about it and study it, but once you feel it, um, it can become a pretty uh, freaky experience because your body changes fast. So I'd say those are the two. Um, otherwise, I felt pretty safe. Luckily for us here in Southern Ontario, in the big scheme of things, um, our trails and communities are, are quite safe. And also for those just writing thanks um, in the comment section, uh, thank you for, for listening today. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Any other questions from anybody? Okay. I guess not. So thank you, Owen, for um, being with us this afternoon. That was great stories and great photography. And um, so I'm just letting everyone know that this presentation will be up on our YouTube channel shortly if you wanted to see it again. And hopefully, Owen, we can do something else in the future. I really hope so. And again, thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity and the time to come on today with the Welland Public Library. Thank you, Annie. Okay, thanks, Everyone guys. Everyone have a great afternoon and weekend. Take care. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.